Network Next Gen, the podcast, inspiring design industry hustlers. All right, awesome. Well, let's get started. I'm very honored to be moderating this panel because we have some amazing, amazing, talented people here. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, I'm going to have them each introduce themselves um, because I feel like it's a little weird to listen to someone introduce you, especially if they get any information wrong. So Farshid, we're going to have you go first. You ready? Farshid Tafazoli, Chief Revenue Officer, Co-Founder of Material Bank. Say a little bit about your background. My background, uh, I'm a uh, young entrepreneur, no longer young. Uh, <laughs> I, I uh, will give you my quick version. Left home at 16 with $1,200 to my name, ended up on a path of Wall Street, started one of the first electronic brokerage firms uh, that ended up uh, the very beginning of time that there were brokers, physical brokers, and it was transitioning to a digital model where you type in orders, what everyone now knows today. Uh, ended up becoming one of the early NASDAQ uh, firms. Uh, very insecure, so I constantly worked on other new businesses that all touched on basically Wall Street and uh, software. And from there, somehow I've landed in this amazing industry with all of these amazing, kind people. All right, next up. I'm Kendra Shea. Uh, I am an independent interior designer out of Seattle, Washington. Uh, my journey is, I was actually a dancer from three until my early 20s. And when my body decided I was done, I had to find a new way to be creative and kind of show that passion. So I went to design school. Um, in New York City, moved out to Seattle, Washington, where I'm located now, worked for a couple of firms doing hospitality, education design, and then in 2019 started my own um, firm, KSJ Designs, and then in 2020 started my podcast, Design Over Drinks, where I talk to young interior designers, and by young I mean young in the industry, 10 years and under, and talk about that journey from student to professional, because it is very much the underserved community in my mind. Thanks for being here. Hello, um, I'm Susan Suhar. I am with HDR Architecture out of Los Angeles. I am their uh, interior design director for the West region. And I actually started my career in Chicago, um, spent over 20 years here before relocating to LA seven years ago. And um, pretty much I, my journey started with uh, Syracuse University starting in a program there, but it was actually not architecture, it was environmental science. And went from Syracuse to the West Coast, thinking I was still on that journey of environmental science, worked for the state senate as a clerk, and knew, got enough exposure there that I didn't want to go into political science, um, and meandered my way back into design and interior design and interior architecture. And what's great is that background now lands me here with HDR doing a lot of sustainability interiors, which is um, really wonderful because it's a really important topic that I think we're, many of us are passionate about. So happy to be here. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. My name is, excuse my voice, I don't always sound like this, but it's been a rough couple of days. <laughs> um, my name is Cynthia Saria. I'm an, a senior interior design professional with the HOK Miami office. I um, started my, I guess, journey into design uh, by getting an undergrad at Kane University in New Jersey, which is where I worked for the first uh, six or seven years of my career. Um, I worked with a large firm there and then um, ended up moving to Miami, where I am now with HOK. Um, throughout my career, I think I've, I've always participated in IIDA events and things of that nature. I've served on several boards. I've also been um, an adjunct professor. So that's a little bit of, I, I share a little bit about the passion that you were talking about earlier. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much. You can tell why these um, individuals were selected to be on the panel. Um, very different backgrounds, lots of experience up here. Um, so some of the perfect people to talk about the future of design. So let's jump into it. Uh, future of design. I don't know about you guys. When I hear words that are kind of buzzwords like future, I'm like, Come on, what do, do any of us know? We're all kind of making it up, right? But there is some truth to the ideas of trends and predictions for the future. So I would love to hear from each of you, what do you think of when you hear future of design? Like, what does that bring up for you? What are your thoughts on it? 
Um, we'll just ask each of you in kind of a row if that works, and then we can always popcorn it at the end. But um, Farshad, when you hear future of design, what does that kind of bring up for you? So I think of a number of things that come. By the way, I intentionally said don't share the questions that you're going to ask so that I take them <laughs> at will, unprepared. The others are prepared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll clearly show. You'll see. What, one, of the, one of the dynamics just sort of coming into this industry as an outsider, right? I didn't sort of grow up inside of this field. That's fascinating. Here we are at a design center. And if you stand outside the design center, people don't know what takes place inside here. And there are dynamics that are very interesting to me. So I'm an inquisitive guy. I stand out there and I go, tell me what happens in here. Am I allowed to walk in? And people believe that you have to walk in with you know, some parental uh, guidance, right? You can't walk in on your own. So you have to walk in with a designer. And they're not sure if there are prices on items that are here. I, I don't know about a segment of industry, but let, let's just take any part of our, let's just say we're going to buy a car. We can't go into the building. And then when you do, you have to go in with a professional and then there are no prices there and everybody sort of gets different prices. That's baffling for me. So when, when I think about the future of the business, first of all, I look for the Berlin Wall moment where, where price transparency really comes to light and where everyone has, in a democracy particularly, true unfettered access into this industry. The second part that I think about as I go through this uh, industry is how far behind this industry is from adopting technological innovation and change uh, versus other industries. So, you know, for us, that was really kind of obvious. I sort of went from Wall Street screens where everything was real time, second by second, price changes, instantaneous executions and transactions, to then waiting two weeks for a carpet rep to bring carpets out of the trunk of their car and wait for a dolly to bring them upstairs for a billion and a half dollar hotel project. <laughs> so it seemed very obvious that that was another, another area of change. And the last one, which I would ask each and every one of you to place at the very top, that's just a clear change that's coming, is AI. And I know it sounds cliche because you're starting to hear about it a lot, but I would actually ask the question of AI in a totally different way. If I said to everyone here in the audience, would you like to be smarter? And I'm gonna give you just this one thing that's gonna make you smarter. I think everyone would raise their hands and say, yes, I wanna be smarter. Give me that one simple, easy thing. It's like asking how many here want to be thinner. I'll be the first one to raise my hand, right? <laughs> right? So we all want to be thinner. We all want to be smarter. We all want to you know, grow from there and be healthier. And that's what AI to me is. It, it is really the enabler that will make everybody smarter. The part we get uncomfortable about within that aspect is that being smarter may also be a threat to our livelihoods. And that's the discomfort. And that's what we have to bring front and center. Um, for me, I think the future of design is women-led firms, women-led and, and more diverse um, kind of people of color led firms um, not, and in general just more diversity. I think right now we are very homogenous um, as an industry. Um, and I also think it is the integration of interior design through all aspects of the project. So not just bringing them in halfway through or at for certain points, but understanding that design needs to be there in, and interiors needs to be there when you are starting a project from conception um, for concept and storytelling, because that's what we do. We tell stories as designers. And so being able to tell those stories with your whole team all the way through. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of, I'm one of them, I guess, but these really small firms of two or three people doing this amazing work and really changing the way we work. And that's been really what I see right now. So um, I think I see 
or think about three things when it comes to the future of design. Um, the one is adaptability. I mean, that's constantly that really what drives design, uh, whether design leading adaptability in things that we didn't know we need or our, um, our, our needs, whether they're social needs or work needs, driving that. Um, and that will always, always be the case. Um, but obviously we saw in the last three years such a significant evolution of design in response to um, the pandemic that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, in response to AI, when I, you know, obviously that, that is something that we all think about, you know, is my job at risk? You know, what part of my job is at risk with this type of technology that is just going to get more smart? But um, with that, I also see that there's probably going to be kind of not a backlash, but a, um, a desire to hone on to tradition and a realization of the craft, you know, um, and, you know, we'll, we'll embrace this technology because I think we'll see, um, realize other, other aspects, you know, that it's going to fulfill and perhaps not take jobs away. But I think there will also be that um, embracement of, of history and tradition as well coming with that. And then obviously um, sustainability, you know, that's, that is such um, something that we're in the now with and that we're having to respond to. And the other aspect of sustainability is the social aspect. And I think that is just still, we're in the infancy of that. And it's a really giant, giant um, demand that we're responding to on our projects, but there's that deeper impact of our supply chain and all of our contribution and awareness of the environmental, the social, the governance, the, you know, the ESG of it all, that it will just, I think, keep taking momentum. And you know, the investment um, banking is, is a big con contributor to that. So I think that's just something that we're going to expect take, taking more traction and will be a big change with that. Um, I think we're all kind of on the same wavelength when we think about the future of design, but if I had to pick three words, I would probably pick technology, right? AI and, you know, other things that I won't spoil for the rest of the conversation that we'll get into. <laughs> um, so I think we're all at the forefront of that, and I, what's really exciting about it is that we know it's coming, and when you know that something's coming, you're able to prepare yourself to get ahead of it. And I think that that brings me to point number two, which is humanity, and the fact that Yes, these tools will, in fact, make our lives easier and make our work smarter. But at the end of the day, design is human centric and there's nothing that can replace the human brain and how you design and interact with a space because we understand how to travel through space. Therefore, we understand how to design it and design for it. Um, the second aspect, of, I think, of that humanity is when you take into, into account what we just went through with the pandemic and balance across all fronts, work life, neurodiverse um, balances that you want to create in the workplace, um, you know, having a diverse just population within this industry, which is still a challenge that we have today. I think we're probably much more aware about it. And so we're, you know, in a great position to make adjustments and to, and to kind of push that forward. But that's that. And I, um, I think also just this next generation and how we're leaving like, the world that we're leaving them. So... <laughs> Like, I think I, I, I'm excited to see how that takes on a role of design, not just within the built environment, but just within, like, the bigger picture. You know, I'm always interested because, first, people speak about what their position is. And when I describe we're going to go through AI and love your view, I mean, diversity is absolutely amazing. Your view is incredible. We all agree on these. So my, my perspective is not one where we have nothing to lose if AI comes in. Um, you know, we have 14 collective businesses in the design world, we're largest media company in architect and design. And then there's Material Bank on, on top of it. There's a lot on the line, but I have to be real. I mean, I have to wake up and really address what's taking place. And, and history does play a fairly good role in my eyes on this. So, you know, beginning of the 19th century, we had in parts of this country, amazing country, right? I, I'm a first generation immigrant. I came at six. Uh, we had almost 75% of the workforce in many areas that were on the farm. 
The lowest in any part of the country was 50%. The person to your left, the person to your right, they were on the farm, right? That's remarkable. They were all displaced when one piece of technology came out called the tractor. Oh my God, the tractor. You know, we started, we're, we're three 80 year olds side by side, America, right? We're 246 years old roughly. It's remarkable to me how young this country is and how we panic over things that are so early stage. Uh, the 10th president of the US, President Tyler, his grandson is still alive. That's how young we are. And we started off with 0% of world trade, 0% of GDP of the entire world. And going through all of these challenges, we've gone through two depressions, 12 recessions, a plight, a civil war. Uh, it's an incredible country, ridiculously resilient. 75% of the workforce got displaced and yet we still now got up to 25% of the world's trade. So if we go through a disruption, it doesn't mean that the world is over, that this is a zero sum game. In my eyes, this really translates to human beings are doing what we've always done. Let's go beyond the 380 year olds. Let's go back a thousand years plus. Uh, we survive and we come out with new things. We're on a podcast. This was a job that didn't exist, right? We, we have many roles that didn't exist prior. I would say this just goes back to your point about how we have to be able to be flexible and we have to be able to kind of roll with the punches and when the technology comes our way, we say, okay, it doesn't work like this anymore, but if we pivot like this, we can really figure it out. And the pandemic did a great job of showing us that and just recently, right? But I think if you go back to 2008, everyone will have stories of how they had to make the change to figure out if they wanted to stay or go and how to do that. Great. Wow. Well, in our first question, we covered three of the questions. <laughs> so we're just going to keep moving forward. This is great. Um, okay. So let's talk about innovation um, really quick. So we're all trying to innovate. If you're a designer, there's tons of designers, product designers, interior designers. Every designer we've talked to so far during Nikon has talked about they're trying to innovate. They're trying to be different. So let's talk about innovation. What really separates you in the marketplace but what really separates you, right? Because everyone thinks they're doing something new and it's not always the case. You can stroll through the, the, um, the halls of the Merchandise Mart and sometimes you're like, I don't know, some of this stuff looks similar. Some of it really does stand out as innovate, innovative and a, a new thing. So how do you separate yourself in the marketplace as truly innovative and an original product or design among all the noise? How are we going to follow him? You know your place. Yes, yes, start it. Um, so I... I'm the problem. <laughs> um, no, you're not the problem. Um, so I'm a, I'm a millennial, and when I first started working, there was all this conversation about how millennials are going to work and what do they like, and it was... It, was, it, it just became a little much after a while, but I think... What, what it did teach is that age group and, and the people that work with them and you know whatever is that you always have to challenge what exists and that's what innovation is, right? It's like, yes, it's difficult when you walk into a meeting with you know billionaires that are putting together a ground, you know, a high rise building of 25 floors of, of, of typical workplace to tell them, yeah, no, this workstation is not it or this orientation that we have for a conference room isn't the right layout, especially in a post-pandemic world where the majority of the meetings that we have are, are, are hybrid, right? There's a lot of people that are behind a screen. There's some in the room and you have to have an equitable experience for everybody. So I think innovation really is challenging and even if it feels uncomfortable and even if you think you might get thrown out of the room, you, you just have to challenge it. And I think some of the products actually that I saw upstairs today were really cool around specifically the conference table and how it's being oriented. And then that, that sort of focus is not around a screen per se, like individually here. Like there's a very big emphasis on how to bring both worlds together. Yeah, I think um, innovation comes in two forms. It's the solution that you didn't know some, is something that you needed. And it's like, you know, we've all had those, that moment where it's like, God dang it, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know, you knew you had the issue. 
You yeah. just didn't really think about the solution, yeah. you know? And then somebody else did it, and now they're a bazillionaire. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it, it, there's always that innovative part of it. The other is the engineering. And, um, you know, today we, I saw a re really cool stool that goes from a stool to a chair. One form, one design goes from a stool to a chair. And I thought it was engineered extremely, have not seen anything like that. So it's, um, you know, those, those are the really um, innovative moments. They're, they're the solo, unique, and then everyone else that takes that and evolves it, they're only evolving it. It's not being really innovative, and it's great. And that's kind of what you're saying. You know, like we, we walk around, we see a lot of like a very similar product, and maybe it's a little tweak here, tweak there, different colors. Um, expressed differently, but I think, you know, it's, that's, to me, it's how I perceive innovation. Um, just, it's, it's the first person to do something that is completely different and unique. Yeah. I believe innovation comes from, we have to solve a problem usually, right? It comes from failure. We have failed at something. How do we somehow make it better? Um, this one's actually really a tough question for me, I will say. I think, because um, I kind of agree maybe with what both of you are saying. In general, for me this year, it's a lot of, okay, I've seen this. This is similar, small iterations. Um, and so I think it's trying to find a problem. So for me, when I did go to Fulton Market, the one thing I did see that totally kind of blew my mind was this idea of untethered workstations. So battery-powered um, you know, desks, battery powered, like everything was battery powered and you could literally sit outside and work at a desk. And that to me is the coolest thing I've seen in a long time. Cause so often, no matter where we are, we must still be plugged in. So, but they, and you know, so then talking to them, it was because right post pandemic, people needed the ability, you know, coming back to the office, not everyone wants to keep at a desk. Not everyone comes every day of the week, you know, so being able to have a place to lock your stuff, but then you can go sit at this desk over here or, um, you know, they had a literally a battery powered table that also connected to a TV. So you could have a TV and everyone could have their devices plugged in, it was sit stand, and it was all run off of batteries. So like that, but it was them solving a problem, them finding a failure and fixing that failure. So in my mind, innovation comes from kind of understanding what the problem is and switching it over. And I feel like Material Bank did exactly that. I, I, I don't always think it's a failure, though. I think, I think, you know, people just get used to something, and we could be doing the same thing day in and day out because that's what we get used to. Um, but, I, you know, but it's when someone says, I can make that better, I can make it more efficient, I can give you the flexibility. Um, but I don't, it's not always a failure that's driving that. I think it's, right? Just because we've always done it that way doesn't mean we should continue to do it that way. Exactly, and I think that's... Um, I, I, a few weeks ago, I was talking to somebody about this, and um, they're actually a, a commercial real estate executive, and they said, you know what? I want people to be innovative. Therefore, all our, our, our architects, I don't want prescriptive specs. They want, they want it, you know, they want to give the architects more broader opportunity to come up with something innovative, not make it so it has to match this, it has to be this, it has to be this. As soon as you start defining the parameters, you're doomed. You have no space for evolution. I wanted to answer the second part of your question is how do you, um, how do you distinguish yourself, right? And I, I think you're touching on something really cool, which is that like, there's this level of passion and there's level of ingenuity that we all have, which is why we're in this industry to begin with. And so, Part of that is that authentic person that you are within that as a designer and as a creator and as an innovator is the thing that has to come forward. And I think that's why your brand is so successful because it's part of this idea to create something and again, just be authentic to what you believe in and what, you, what problem you wanna solve, right? And it always comes from a place of passion. That's what sets you apart. I hope you guys still like me after this answer. But <laughs> Look, there. I think that we have to distinguish there's evolutionary and there's revolutionary, yeah. right? Yeah. Revolutionary is what's innovation. 
we're describing chairs, we're, we're describing fire, we're describing things that were there in Roman times. There is not truly innovation. The, the insides of where I see a, a faster evolutionary process are things like health, right? So we used to put PVC and everything that caused cancer and all kinds of other things. But I don't look at it from that perspective. I actually look at it as why. Why is this place look like the same exact pace of, of evolutionary process? There's nothing revolutionary, not even material thing. It's not, nothing revolutionary. Uh, and, I and think you're underselling it, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the reason is, is that, that uh, we have produced a society that is incentivized to go to Wall Street because they hear that's where they make their fortunes. And so we have a, a, a tremendous amount of brain resources that are coming out drawn purely to dollars. And they are not drawn to this industry. It's got beauty and, and it's got some remarkable parts, but young kids are, are drawn instead towards, towards things that are pocketbook related things that are materialistic, far greater than any other aspect. And I think that's really where the, where the issues are. If you created an incentive, and you know, let's just say that anyone who, who came into this industry, their debts were offset, they got a million dollars after 10 years, we'd draw some, we, <laughs> no, we would, it, we would draw some ridiculous talent and we'd draw some, some amazing um, uh, you know, folks who would who would come in, and so my response is that there are not there is not enough eyes and attention, and enough dollars on bringing about about uh, revolutionary changes, and we are one commonality that we all describe our culture, uh, everything that sort of we've done, uh, is a is based on a pain point, so things are based on a pain point, and not everything comes quickly when you have a pain point. So how many of us have a piece of luggage with four wheels on it? Everyone. Yeah. What year do you think that came out? The original? Yeah, the first one. Yeah, I mean, we've been traveling, right, since, since before Roman times. No, like 1920s probably, or 30s. 1920s, 1930s, 40s. It was the 1980s that we came up with really? the ability to put four wheels on it. So be patient, you know, there, there, there's, there's time. Uh, common sense items, you're right, we accept. We just yeah. say that's the way it's supposed to be. And I'm, it's only after the fact that we're like, come on. Yeah. I will challenge you a little bit though, in terms of putting a dollar amount as an incentive to gather talent in this industry. Because the talented people, a lot of the, ta not everybody obviously, right? But a lot of the talented people in this industry don't do it for the money. <laughs> this is not the industry that you choose to become a millionaire in. But because of that, you're able to see things that somebody who is chasing a dollar won't see. And you're able to make spaces for people from a humanistic, equitable standpoint because you're not chasing the dollar amount. So I will challenge you slightly, but I think I agree with the rest of it. Very fair, but we're, we're surrounded by $20,000 desks and $35,000. So, I mean, we're not doing it for equitable. There, there is not, to me, this is not a, 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 a level playing field. You're 100% right on what you're saying, but it's not a, these are not inexpensive products. And from, from my perspective, if that Berlin wall falls, when it falls, what happens is you then make design available for everybody. And, and so design is not something that you can unsee, right? Design is something that there are six-year-olds who get an iPhone. They saw design. They now, if they get a clunky phone from the 80s and 90s, they know that has no design. This has design. They know that when they see Target in their lives and clothing from there, that's available for the masses. They see design, they can't unsee that. So when you see that beauty, you can't put it back in the bottle. And my thesis is the broader that gets adopted, the more common that's available, then you'll have a larger audience that comes. And the larger audience that comes, the more dollars that get spent in that community, 
which creates more opportunities for a revolutionary product rather than an evolutionary. Yeah, I think that's, I guess right when we talk about revolutionary product, I mean, you define revolution by affecting the, the mass population. That's what is revolutionary. I, I mean, you're, you've had me here sitting here thinking what in our world of design as designers, furniture designers, interior designers, architects, is revolutionary, um, has been revolutionary. So, I mean, we have our phone. That's not us. That's technology. I think I'm trying to think, was it the task chair, a chair on wheels? Yeah, ergonomics, the sit-stand desk, but that's still not like a mass. I mean, I'm just curious, what is it, what are your opinions of what would the open office back in the day, right? Like that changed the way offices were, were built. But I can't think of anything nearer either. I think something that's revolutionary in interior design, I, I, I focus primarily on workplace, is, I mean, biophilia. I try not to say the word because it's such a, you know, whatever word nowadays. But there was a point in time where everybody existed in a box. And it was unthought of. And it seems now, looking back, like that's so simple. Just make the open office. Duh, right? Where in 2023, it doesn't feel revolutionary, but it was. It really, really was. And you talked about the task chair. At any point, for us to do the science and the research behind ergonomics and wellness, right? And again, that goes back to, to the biophilic elements, the sustainability elements. Like all of these like focuses on how to make the place that you inhabit 80% of the time to be healthy for you. Um, maybe a new one is, uh, there's been a lot about mushrooms and lysium and how that has been, you know, we're turning natural fibers that are very soft into functional long-term projects or products. And so that's also been an interesting thing, right? Like I think maybe that's where we're seeing some of the innovation is not using plastic for everything, and, but it's still being a durable, uh, yeah, exactly, a durable product without kind of off-gassing and all that stuff. All right, guys, so we're going to ask you this question um, just to be pretty quick, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, so we'll do that, and then we'll have our final thoughts after that, all right? So this question is, we already kind of talked about AI a little bit. We talked about tech. Um, is there anything in the AI tech space, anything design-related, tech trends, anything like that that you want to call out that maybe people haven't seen, anything that's blown your mind recently um, that has changed your performance? And if you say no, that's cool too. But just curious if there's anything tech-related um, just to cover that little bucket, and then we can kind of move forward from there. Oh, I get so many sort of AI companies coming and I sign these legal documents that I won't speak about them, so I'm kind of afraid <laughs> of breaking an NDA of some kind. Uh, I'm informationally advantaged. There's some amazing things. This is not something coming. This is in the room. This, this is in the room. And, and the pace of innovation, if there is just one metric that you want to look at, it is the number of downloads in the shortest period of time so how many human beings have brought it, log into it on a daily basis and are utilizing it? Not in the history of mankind have we had that. So yes, there, is, there are items. And then within that, there are very specific segments that, uh, that I'm seeing that are, that are mind blowing. Uh, and I'll describe it this way. Electricity was revolutionary. AI is revolutionary. I think of the parallel between the two because once you had electricity, you had to build things on top of electricity. And so, for example, the refrigerator was amazing. In the office space, you had an elevator. That was amazing, right? Imagine how much healthier I would be if I had to go up the <laughs> stairs still. I mean, that would be horrible. Right? So, so, so. The thing that I think about is that AI in particular is a platform now that it's being built upon. And, and the framework that I see that I, I think is just rather clear is those that have private data, data that others do not see, they're the ones at massive advantage. Remember I said, how many here wanna be smarter? That's AI, everyone does. 
And so that's general. But the ones that will really stand out within AI are the ones that will have private data. And let's just give you a quick example in the way I think about it. If there is a hospital that has private data from one particular type of terrible cancer, they are informationally advantaged and you would want to, as a patient, be treated by the protocol that has the data sets and, and the protocols from all of those patients versus the hospital that doesn't. And, and so that is private data, not available anywhere else. And I think about those companies, those individuals who can build those types of pieces, they'll be the ones that have the greatest impact on, on society in a positive way. Um. I feel like technologically, there isn't a lot right now, at least for me, but I kind of want to follow up on the chat GPT stuff a little bit before we move on. So I went to the keynote yesterday and we were talking about technology and how that all works. And she brought up a really good point that AI is based off of what humans know. So it could never go past the collective human knowledge at this point. So you know, we were talking about how it's going to affect interior design. And it was really interesting if you went to the keynote. It was really fascinating where she's pulling up, you know, she typed in CEO of a company and it was a white dude. And no matter how far she went, it was always a white dude. Or and there was no women. I think there was one man of color. Um, but again, it just, it is based upon the perceptions of us as a collective human. I mean, we're just at the infancy of, of AI. So it's a baby and it's growing and it's going to become an adult. And my thought is it will collectively, because it'll be using all of our brain power, become a superpower. And um, when you talk about private data, we already have data breaches. So how that is going to be navigated and protected is beyond my brain capacity. Um, you know, I just, I think about AI more specifically in how it affects me and my profession. Um, not because I get overwhelmed at the possibility of, of the greater, the greater, whatever it becomes. Um, but I do find it fascinating when I think about so much of our time when we're designing buildings is, is based on programming and, um, insight analysis and, how a you know AI can leverage an efficiency of that, um, and and just like spit out a bazillion different um, options, basically you know just you know with metrics and data attached to it. I think there's something exciting about it, um, and seeing where that will go in a more um, efficient and sustainable type of way, um, and really just knowing that probably. You know, we're so we're we're talking about life here, and I think this is just going to become something existential, and and that's that's where it's going. Not in my lifetime, any of our lifetime, but next generations. All right, Cynthia, any, anything? I'll keep it quick. I know we're I know we're on time crunch. I'll answer the question with a more direct uh, piece of technology that I've experienced recently, which is. It's a data-informed kind of platform that allows you to see the way that people occupy space, which I think helps us a lot when we design, right? Because oftentimes we design um, aspirationally and we, ex we expect folks to use things in a certain way, and that usually works, sometimes it doesn't. And so when you have the data to kind of back up how you actually occupy, a, or how folks occupy a space that you've designed, it allows you to just quantify that design decision and Right, it becomes it, it becomes a more data driven design, data informed design, which I think, um, yeah, okay. everyone likes that. What's that <laughs> called? I'll have to get you the exact name of it, but there's versions of it with like Cisco and things of that nature, where like you um, track how conference rooms are used, you track who's um, like you know in a hybrid work environment if if people are in the office one day and not in the office another day, like how many workstations are booked and how many aren't you know, it kind of follows like the warmth of the body and how people occupy a space or a conference room, right? Like, so it's okay. it's interesting. All right, guys, well, I wanna open it up to the audience for questions. Yeah, do you have a question? You got so excited, I love the energy, thank you. <laughs> do you want, oh, you want, oh, I've never done this before. Okay, here we go. 
थैंक यू हाय आई एम मयूर मिस्ट्री ग्रेट डिस्कशन एंड दिस क्वेश्चन रियली फॉलोज अप सो वी हैव सीन अ लॉट ऑफ ए आई इमेज जनरेशन बट वी आर ऑल्सो एट अ टाइम वेर ए आई इज ऑल्सो हेल्पिंग इन थ्री डी टास्क एंड वर्क फ्लो ऑटोमेशन वेर यू कुड से क्रिएट रैंडर्स फ्रॉम ई क्रिएट फ्यू कंस्ट्रक्शन ड्रॉइंग्स क्रिएट मॉडलिंग टास्क एंड to the earlier point like proprietary data like mid journey or other tools are based on training on the web if you have a good data of neurodiverse hospital species you could train it on and your ai generation will be way better than the generic models and like i'm a co-founder of 3d guru and we are developing those like 3d task and automation tools where just with natural language it can create 3d designs and like a lot of other things for you so my question is what are some things which in your current workflow uh which you wish uh, an ai assistant could automate <laughs> renumbering rooms renumbering rooms renumbering rooms or when you have to add a room or you have to like so <laughs> i feel like this is one of those weird things when somehow the programming change or the building changes and you lose a room or you gain a room or you need to um renumber all of your details so that they you know and then i don't know if anyone has that revit problem where it's like we can't change this so you have to fake one and then do the whole thing things like that that i spend hours <laughs> just just renaming things oh that'd be great that's funny anything else you guys um mine's similar along the lines but it's really at at a space planning level um and really more at the programming level so helping um you know put in both both the qualitative and the quantitative and i'm just intrigued because i know it's going there i'm intrigued what that would result in um and of course i get nervous about displacing people in our organization but yeah. Yeah. you know that's, that's you know, yeah it, that goes the, back to the earlier point yeah exactly yeah. if there's not another question i'll join mine but um any other questions So I'm glad you said that because I didn't want to say this to you, <laughs> but I don't trust AI. <laughs> so, I mean, I get it. It's great and it's beautiful and it gives us a really pretty picture and that's fine, but how are you going to build it? You still need details. <laughs> you still need to bid the project. You still need to make them. Like there's still a lot of plate things that have to happen before you get to the pretty picture. And there's also, you know, site conditions. You just have to like, is it feasible? Like, so I guess one thing you could add to the AI is make me believe the AI. <laughs> like how do I, how do you vet it? Thank you. You know I'm going to have a response to this guys. Come on. Did you use the elevator today? Yeah. Did you use the elevator? I did. There's AI there. There's yeah, logic. But that's, but, but, right. A couple people died as they built that. A couple of people died. A few arms got cut yeah, off. Yeah, I, I always wait until like the third generation of the iPhone before I get it. So like, yeah, no. So the, the, these are horrible, unfortunate parts of society. We're not going to be able to innovate, move society forward without some some collateral damage. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but we're talking about build, you're not going to build. Do you guys use GPS? Like <laughs> Do you use Waze or Google Maps? It's AI. You're using AI in many, many formats on a, on a daily basis. This is just expanding AI to learn what are called LLMs, right? Large language models. And, and um, you know, that's where I would go. By the way, Pat Sajak retired yesterday. I think, I think, I think you could take the job. <laughs> Thank you. All right, any other quick questions? Does anyone have a final question? And then we're going to move forward. Yeah, OK. All right, um, do any of you have final thoughts you want to share with the group on future technology? Um, we'll keep it there, and that's kind of how we'll end. Final thought? All right. Farsha, or do you have one? No, I, well, it's just the whole AI thing. We're, we're still, still on AI. We're, we're at the <laughs> embassy. So, I mean, just going back to the earlier comment about not trusting it, well, you shouldn't right now, because it's, mm. it's like all new in the last year. Yeah, so... But 
Well, I mean, but the thing is, it's a technology we know is, is going to evolve and is going to revolutionize. And we're all collectively contributing to it. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, it, like I, I, because I, it's a brain, it's an artificial intelligence. It's literally like I wouldn't let my three-year-old, I don't have a three-year-old right now, but I wouldn't let my three-year-old drive my car, you know, but we're like training it. It's got training wheels on right now. One thing I would encourage everybody here to do, we all have Google, that's not AI. You guys got comfortable with, with Google. This is what, the way we sound uh, in going through this is so common. Go back and I literally search the time period when electricity was coming out. Go back and search the time period when the automobile was coming out, what are plastic. we gonna do to the poor people who are not gonna be able to make horse carriages anymore? What are, they, what are they gonna end up doing? This very same thing, this fear, this concern, 19th century, 75% of our workforce on the farm, they didn't trust the tractor. It wasn't safe. People are gonna die. One person did, every farm knew about it. Go and read those, and I think from that context, you'll get more comfortable that we are human beings, we figure it out. The first fire that was made, I'm sure somebody burned their hand. I think and about plastic, the first one, when Bakelite was invented, which was the first plastic, and how, like, here we are now, right, sitting yeah, covered totally. in it, and when it came out, everyone was like, what is this, yeah, yeah, right? I and agree. now it is something that is throughout every portion of our lives. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. I thought it was very interesting. I hope you did as well. Thank you to our amazing panelists who have a lot to bring. So thank you so much, you guys. We appreciate it. And enjoy Neocon. <laughs> thank you, everyone. <laughs>